Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Hello, and welcome to the JVRD Authors Forum podcast. On this episode, we'll be discussing cutting edge research on the effect of pre-filled versus vial-drawn syringes on sustained increases in intraocular pressure in patients treated with a flibercept. This research was recently featured in our upcoming JVRD issue for November and December of 2023, and I am joined by my fellow retina specialist and friend, Dr. Alexander Rachaskaya from the Cole Eye Institute of the Cleveland Clinic. What really were you focused on in the genesis of this paper's development? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for featuring this paper. And of course, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge people who have done most of the work. As we know, uh, a lot of this work is done by trainees. And I would like to give a shout out to Matt Russell, who was a medical student when he was working on this project and is currently uh, PGY1 at Cola Institute. He's done a tremendous work, and the PI for this pro project was Sumit Sharma. Um, and, you know, I think this, this topic is an important one because we all do so many injections, right? I mean, the numbers um, nationwide, worldwide, uh, millions, if not, if not more. And uh, we always wonder about pressure, intraocular pressure. And there's two aspects to the pressure, the pressure immediately after the injection. And also, is there truly a sustained IOP increase over time? Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done in this realm, you know, people looking at different drugs, people comparing uh, anti-VEGF agents to sham, um, you know, people analyzing red, like post hoc analysis of clinical trials, trying to figure out, is there really a relationship? And it seems if you look at the literature that's been published uh, before this study, that overall, Folks believe that there might be some increased, a sustained increase in IOP when you compare anti-VEGF agents to sham. However, there's some studies that they say, well, there's actually none, you know, looking at uh, different agents. So this study was a little different, however. We didn't want to compare anti-VEGF to sham or one anti-VEGF to another anti-VEGF. What we wanted to compare was uh, patients who were treated with um, pre-filled syringe versus the, um, the medication that was drawn from a vial by a physician. Why would you think that there would be a difference? Are you drawing these up into identical syringes with identical needles? And and is the hypothesis that, that the um, pre-filled syringe has a fixed volume while the vial drawn syringe you may pull up more or more air with that i mean what what was what was generating the interest in looking at this so the that's an excellent question and i think in general you know we uh, um luckily in the area of medicine where we have a lot of new therapeutics coming out and a lot of times right when the new therapeutic comes on the market we draw it from the vial and it takes time for it to become in a pre-filled syringe, which is all what we all prefer because it's just more efficient. And uh, we have a history uh, in particular with a flibercept because when a flibercept came out with a pre-filled syringe, there was some issues uh, with the pressure rises immediately after injection. This is not what this paper focused on, uh, but looking at immediately after the injection. It was very interesting because uh, there was actually um, 
a report from a European medical agency kind of highlighting this risk of IP increase with pre-filled syringes. Uh, there was a lot of discussions why this was happening. And it's, it's kind of a uh, fascinating topic if you think about it, how to design a syringe, right? We take for granted that we inject our patients with these pre-filled syringes, but what's the diameter? How does little change depending on the diameter might be different. The thickness of the markings could also contribute, you know, where you place that plunger. So uh, that the idea was born out of that uh, because there was this concern that maybe with pre-filled syringes we were getting um, higher IOP, IOPs immediately after the injection. And we wanted to see, you know, is there something long-term uh, with this particular patient population. So the study uh, focused on treatment naive patients. So the patients who weren't previously treated with anti-VEGF agents and looked at re retrospectively. So this is a retrospective analysis of patients who were treated with um, uh, you know, pre-filled syringes versus those who were treated with the uh, vials that the physicians drew from. And, and did you think potentially of a crossover where you moved your pre-filled patients to vial drawn and your vial drawn to pre-filled trying to eliminate potential bias associated with selection? I think this would be a fantastic analysis. Uh, you know, the we were limited because we were uh, looked retrospectively. And we also, um, the way we had to do it, because uh, there's actually we don't document necessarily if we use a previous syringe. So we had to look back at the times where at our institution, we used, uh, you know, wild drawn uh, versus pre-filled. And there was a period of transition. So we actually excluded that period because we wanted to make sure we were looking at very uh, clearly defined patient populations. But it, it, is a, it is an important question. You know, we, we actually never uh, were able to assess it from that switching standpoint. And how did you come up with what you thought were appropriate numbers in each of the groups to be able to have a powered example? So there's two two aspects that we analyzed. One, to, to your point, is uh, to try to determine uh, if we have enough power. And that's a tricky part. And I think with every retrospective study, when it's an event that's rare, which this is a rare event, um, you know, I we always get concerned about power and um it's it's once again we were limited by history right because we were limited how how much we used uh you know one versus the other and we were limited because we wanted to treat to ch choose treatment naive patients if we could do all comers you know patients who were switched from um, you know, one medication to another and all of that, it would have been much easier. So I think uh, that's, uh, you you picked out on a very important limitation of this study. And then the other question is, how do you define what IOP increases, right? Uh, how, how do you, what do you call an IOP increase? So uh, we looked back at the previous study and tried to uh, find what we felt was uh, previously defined and accepted um, definitions of IOP increase. So uh, we looked um, uh, increase from the baseline uh, by more than five uh, millimeters mercury from the patient's baseline. And we also looked at sustained increase over 22 millimeters mercury. And then we looked at development of glaucoma, which was defined as a di new diagnosis of glaucoma. When did you measure the IOP? And was that measured in a standardized fashion across this entire cohort at the Cleveland Clinic? We have uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we have uh, three methods that the IOP is measured. And uh, for majority of patients, it's consistent, but there is fluctuations that might be clinic specific or even a technician specific, or sometimes, you know, they try with one and they can't get it and they measure it with another one. So we didn't dive down into making sure that it's, it's consistent. Um, although we do have documentation for that and it's possible to do, but uh, we, we were looking more at trends rather than, you know, the specific um, findings like that. Um, but to, to your point, you know, there's so many variables, right, that potentially could play a role in, in analysis like that. Um, and um, 
and I think compared to clinical trials where everything is mandated exactly how it to, has to be done, there is some fluctuations. And you know, and the other the other point, we've all been in clinic where the patient is measured at particular IOP, which doesn't make sense to you as a as a clinician, and you recheck it and get a different number. So we have to remember that these were done by multiple different technicians who work in retina clinics. And I think you've really spoken to some of the, the caveats with retrospective reviews. We, we really have to understand what we're looking at and how the data is collected. And, and so I think you, you know, this is a well-written paper with those caveats in place. So take me through your, your data collection analysis and your results. So if we look at the at the big picture, you know, looking at all of that, we actually didn't see any uh, significant increase in IOP related adverse events when we compare those two groups. And uh, uh, once again, we looked at this long term one year follow up. We didn't look at the immediate pressure. Uh, when we looked in particular, you know, that patients treated with pre-filled syringes, uh, they were less likely to develop uh, ocular hypertension. But once again, the, the numbers were pretty small. And overall, we think that there is no difference uh, between the groups, um, which I think is, once again, a, a reassuring um, somewhat finding. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are we're in this era where we have a lot, we're going back to drawing from vials from a lot of new, for our new medications. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting to, to see these findings. Well, you know, one of the things that we've been focused on more so than the IOP has been the endophthalmitis rates. And it's gone back and forth where some people argued that your pre-filled syringe from your compounding pharmacy was better than your pre-filled syringe from a manufacturer, which may have been better than a vial drawn. So it's it's interesting how those results can span almost every permutation. And I think that's one of the fun things about science is trying to look at that and, and say, what, why? I mean, what what's right. different? Um, now, you know that I'm a big believer in, in modulating the IOP after an injection. So I do a lot of paracentesis, but that's a very rare, I, I, I'm a far exception for that. But it is interesting that when you do paracentesis on your patients and you go back and survey them, out of 100 patients, 98 want you to do the paracentesis again. Oh, interesting, I, yeah. So I think really what that suggests is we, are, we all know that we get that transient spike, right? And patients get nervous if, they're, if they go NLP or they get the headache and, and you have to talk them through that, the pressure is going to come down and it doesn't cause a problem. So it would, it would have been interesting if there was a difference because we do have a strategy that could mitigate that. But in this case, I think what you've really shown quite clearly is it's, it's really not so critical whether it's a vial drawn or a pre-filled syringe. And, and, it, and that's reassuring because you're right. People that were, were really focused on pre-filled syringes, they don't have access to that for some of the medications that we're, we're going at. The other thing is, have you felt that there's one of the, you know, when I look at, at the viscosity of some of the drugs we inject, I'm shocked by how different some of the more recent drugs are. And I, and I really wonder if that's going to play a role that we really haven't even begun to look at. Because each of our anti-VEGFs, they're clearly not all the same in terms of their mechanical, you know, and physical properties. What do you think about that? Have you noticed that also? Yeah, I think it's it's actually very fascinating because we take our injected injections for granted in a way. It's just such a part of our clinic, but it goes back to the technique, right? So there's this whole discussion of the speed of injection. You know, if you inject fast, maybe the pressure goes higher. Uh, you know, and uh, and the patients who do go dark, you know, a lot of times it happens. You know, it, it doesn't happen right away, right? It takes a couple seconds, and sometimes they're sitting up. And you wonder if they, you know, they were so worried about the injection, they didn't have breakfast and they're like actually hypertensive. There's just so many aspects to it that I think it's really hard to tease out what's what. But I think what I take, take from studies like that is, you know, every injection 
you have to think about it. It can be just automatic, you know, and you have to think how you inject, how you prepare, where do you put your plunger? You need to be aware of different syringes because all our pre-filled syringes are going to be slightly different and understand uh, exactly how each medication works to your point. You know, is it more viscous? Is it less viscous? Um, and uh, making sure that we know how to take care of our patients if they do go dark. Also, I think it's important to realize that even though we're retina specialists, you know, I always doc, I mean, the patients see us much more than they see general ophthalmologists, than they see uh, glaucoma doctors. So I always document the nerve when I first meet them and I watch it and I watch their relative pressure because somebody, you know, you we always do it with steroids, but even with anti-VEGF, I, I look at the trends because somebody might start at, let's say 10, and then you see them consistently at 20. Well, 20 is still normal, but it's a 10 difference from their baseline. So I think we, as retina specialists, um, you know, it behooves us to really pay attention to those aspects of patient care. And the other thing I think which is interesting with our intravitreal injections is when I share the care with another retina specialist, my, my patients are always amazed how, how different we all are. And I think you'd think that with, you know, 1.5 million injections a year, we would have a standardized approach. But in fact, I think that we all inject a little bit differently, um, but all with the same focus on no end ophthalmitis, controlled delivery, no elevated intraocular pressure that is unacceptable and close follow-up. So I think that this paper to me and the discussion we have is why, why science in medicine is fun, right? Exactly. Because it's, it's, there's, there's no gimme here. It's really, it's really important and every aspect of this plays a role in the manuscript and the interpretation and the, and the, and the decision process. So what, what is your number one pearl from, from this for our, our listeners? And hopefully those listeners will go on to read the full paper in JVRD. Absolutely. Yeah. Please, please read the manuscript. I think it's, uh, it's fantastic. And, um, uh, you know, once again, big thank you to all my co-authors. Um, I think the, the take home point is, you know, just like you mentioned, uh, we have to be aware how we're treating our patients, whether we're drawing from the vial, whether we're using pre-filled syringes, and and realize you know that those might be a little different and making sure that we're aware of those differences. Luckily, this paper shows that, you know, there's not a big difference in sustained IOP increase, which is great, but, uh, you know, the we have to also remember that this paper looked at a year follow-up and not immediate pressure. and. Uh, and this looked at just one drug, right? So, and we have a variety of drugs that we inject into people's eyes. So Dr. Rajaskaya, thank you for joining us at the Authors Forum for JVRD. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.